Welcome to the V2V Podcast with Short Center Alias, episode 32. Ta-da. Is this 30? I think it's 33, isn't it? This is V2V Podcast, episode... Your mom. Is it? Is it really? I don't know. Yeah. We'll find out real quick. Because it's important that we keep track of how many episodes we've got. But it's amazing that we've lost count because we've come this far. This is also awesome. This is the first time we've actually awesome. debated it. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so there was 30. The, 30 was the rules of pimping, which was fantastic. Yeah. Um, a lot of pimpology was explained. Yeah. And uh what what thirty one was thirty one was um it's a trap. It's a trap About, All right, so uh, we are on thirty two then. It was thirty two. Incredible. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> That's pretty wow. 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 Pretty, pretty, pretty hot. Wow. Pretty cool. Wow. Pretty hey. Thanks. So we, we got a suggestion from a, a fan uh, for a topic, mm-hmm. um, from our, our dear and I would say beautiful friend. I would say that, um, Allison Ray. From uh, from Ooh. up in Oregon, and she suggested that we talk about feminist porn. Um, so I thought, okay, because the last suggestion she made was about underground clown sex parties. Yes, and and that that went over really well. No, yeah. nobody knew about that. I didn't know about that. And I, I, I yeah. No, no, not much experience there. I would, no. I would be um, very curious if you had known about that. That would have been interesting. <laughs> 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 oh, oh yeah, we, underground clown sex parties. We go way back. Oh, those oh. things. Yeah, I did a lot of that, that in my twenties. Yeah, that would explain a lot, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so uh, feminist porn. Um, what what is it? Is it good? Is it what? Uh, so there's a there's a video here. It's a um, from a uh, a lady named Olivia Tarplin. She's a uh, she's from Jersey City. And that's fantastic. And she has a uh, degree in global studies with a concentration in Gender and Media Studies from the New School in 2014. So she studies um, gender, politics, sexuality, media, and specifically mm. pornography, mm. focusing on the thriving industry of feminist pornography. And she has spent the past two years studying how experiments in feminist porn can change the wise, widespread sexual culture and how porn made ethically can act as a new and approved way to educate the masses about sex. Um, So, feminist porn is like ethical porn. Okay. It's nice. It's nice porn. You know? People are enjoying themselves. Right. And they're getting, they're getting paid like fairly, I guess, too. That's part of it. For posing on camera. Right. And right. I think a lot of it is um lesbian porn, I believe. Um I I don't know for sure. But I think that, that kind of pisses, to with... that kind of pisses me off. That's bullshit. Okay. Right. But anyway, you know. Well, I mean, cuz men can be feminist too in the sense that that we as men want Equity for women, 
You know, we want them yeah. to be on the same playing field, you know, equality wise. But also but I've seen some either. videos I've also seen videos yeah. where there were there were some lovely young ladies enjoying some men, you know? And enjoying, well, you know, what what men were offering in the video as well, you know. I mean like to, to think right. that, that women aren't going to enjoy men. That's really kind of... Anyway, okay. Well, here's another weird thing about that, too, is that, generally speaking, in the, in the porn world, uh, women far outclass men as far as uh, money is concerned. Yeah. Um, they make far more money than, than any, any yeah. you know, random dick, right? They, I mean... Yeah. It's true. So, and the objectification the of the of the male in porn also is you never see the man's face. You only see his penis. You know? Yeah, and that's and weird too. I know, right? That's it's very strange. So um maybe uh maybe people can explain further their their views or what they think feminist porn is, because I think it's kind of it's too um vague to really yeah pin yeah. down um so that it occurred to me i was listening to another podcast that i enjoy listening to last night mm. and they were talking about the youtube rabbit hole and right. and what that is is if you have YouTube on autoplay and you're watching a video and just let it play and let the next one play and the one after that. It you <laughs> tend to you tend to get away from the original topic that you were watching. Like there's right. something in the YouTube algorithm that that picks the next video. And yeah. and we're gonna do a little bit of an investigation on on how that works, starting out with this video on feminist porn, and we're just going to go forward and see kind of what what comes next. Maybe we'll cool. learn a, maybe we'll learn more about feminist porn, um, but I don't know. So yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna click the button, and we're gonna see what the next video is. And okay. I will provide I will provide links to all of these videos so people can can see what what we're looking at rather than just kind of hear the the description. So, yeah, here we go. All right, what's next? Next, when fantasy meet, meets reality. Okay, mm. when fantasy meets reality. And by, uh, by a guy named Mike Anderson. Who's Mike Anderson? And why is he talking about when fantasy meets reality? Sexual communication in relationships. So that's, uh, he's talking about the disclosure of sexual fantasies. Sure. Um, and how, how that can play into the reality and he can make your fantasies reality, I guess. Right. And that's okay. That's cool. Let's see what's next. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the next video in, we're letting, we're just letting YouTube pick now. The next video is um, a video about the psychology of seduction. Mm. Wow. The psychiatrist wow. is talking about the psychology of seduction. And he's arguing that much human distress arises out of relationships, but we can all become more skilled in our relationships, be they in the domain of friendship, romance, work, or career. Deploying the psychological principles behind seduction. Whoa. Ooh. So you're, uh, you're going to seduce your boss, I guess? Like, maybe. Hey, hey, boss. <laughs> hey, nice, hey. uh, nice desk you got there, boss. I oh, love you. your boss sign on your desk, boss. It's, oh, yeah. It's power. Got your name and then like, the little title boss. underneath? Yeah. Boss. Okay. Um, so, we're, we're moving away from <coughs> feminist porn pretty quickly. Mm. Yeah. Um, 
And the next video up is, what is that? The Science of Flirting. Huh. Becoming a Hot Ape. What? I feel like YouTube is driving us or thinking that we want to watch videos about how to date or how to be in a relationship and no psychology about relationships. Right. And this particular video is is by a, a social anthropologist named Jean Smith, and she calls herself a flirtologist. Mm. And, and in this video, she's going to demonstrate her six simple steps known as hot ape. And I, that's, I don't know what that means exactly. It's initialized, H-O-T-A-P-E, but... It spells out hot ape. Are you a hot ape? We'll, we'll find out. If you watch yeah. that video, you might find out whether or not you're a hot ape or not. Yep. But we're not going to do that. We're going to move on. We're not going <laughs> to do that. Because the next video removes us from sex altogether. Mm. And it's a video about the skill of humor. Ooh. How do you pop Yeah. Yeah. I'm so going to show you so how, to, you, how to utilize yeah. humor. Yeah. yeah. Apparently, most people don't think they can uh, use humor, and they're not, they don't think they're funny. But this guy is going to explain how to do that, which is probably useful. Okay. So we are so far removed from feminist porn at this point that it's it's incredible. And the next selection by YouTube down our rabbit hole is Kyle McDonald explains what if you could trade a paper clip for a house? Do you know this story? Yeah, I think I do. I don't know if it's real. I never. Yeah. It's about a kid. It's about a kid who, who trades a paperclip for like a pen, and then a pen for a watch, and a watch yeah. for a calculator, and a calculator for a, like a laptop computer, and then you know on and on over a month, trading up, and eventually trading like a car for a house. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's urban legend. I don't know if it's real. I mean, the idea behind it seems reasonable. <laughs> I guess. It's a lot of work. I mean, who would... You'd have to find someone who really wanted a paperclip and had, like, had a, a pen that they wanted to trade you. I mean, it'd be yeah. a lot of work. It's, all of this is just too much work for me. And I don't network that well. And you'd have to have such social deep connections. Like, you'd have to know a rich guy with multiple cars who's willing to trade whatever you have for that car. And then, like, a dude with multiple houses who's willing to give you these houses for the car. You know? I mean, I feel like this is all, like, circumstantial. Right. And this is a, we're talking about a kid, too, who... Right. Uh, traded a red paper clip for a pen and then a pen for a doorknob. Yeah. And then I don't know where it went from there, but um, apparently he traded um, the doorknob for something else that was cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's interesting. What's next? YouTube. What's next is a video about, wow, it's from the London Business School. Wow. Huh. When money isn't real, the $10,000 experiment. So this guy <laughs> is, he did a $10,000 Monopoly game with his kids to show them or to teach finance management in a cashless society. Right. Well, that seems kind of that seems kind of goofy because we don't live in a 
cashless society. So why would you teach your kid how to, about how to live in a cashless society? We, we're not quite there yet. And why why would this be on a business London business school thing if business is sort of a cash kind of thing? Well, I'm sure that this guy got money for for his talk. Hmm. Hmm. I don't think he uh, did it for free. Mm. -mm. So the, apparently this guy's core message is that we're all after the same thing, to relentless, relentlessly pursue our passions, live simply and happily, and make a difference to those around us. Really? Huh. If, I mean, I think if that was the case, then people would just do that, but it doesn't, that doesn't seem like the world that we really live in, where, um, people want to, uh, Pursue their passions, live simply and happily, and make a difference. Um, who wants to? People say they want to live simply, but I don't even think that means anything. Hmm. Oh. Okay. And uh, the the YouTube rabbit hole. Oh, hold on. The YouTube rabbit hole continues. I thought it didn't continue. It looked like there was a glitch in the matrix for a second and YouTube was perhaps listening to our, our bad mouthing of their selected videos and, and froze my laptop up for a second. <laughs> wow. Wow. Nice try, YouTube. Ah, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so the next... Now, what's interesting is that we started on... TEDx talks and we remain on TEDx talks down this rabbit hole in this case. I am, I am logged out and I don't, so there's nothing that YouTube is looking at that I would enjoy or they think that I would enjoy to watch. Right. Um, let me, cause this one is how to sound smart in your TEDx talk. So I'm going to sign back in and continue as me. Okay. And to see if anything changes, like to, maybe it will move us off of these seminars into some Sam Harris breathing. Could be some ha housekeeping, maybe a little housekeeping first. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. So <clears throat> housekeeping. We're housekeeping. Right. How does sound smart in your TEDx talk? Okay. Um, I would imagine that, I mean, just to guess, my thoughts about how to sound smart in your TEDx talk would be actually to be smart and talk. Wow. It's, inc it's like mind-blowing, like how to smart sound it. smart. Like, you yeah, may get a viral stuff. video for giving that information, man. That's like viral video, know. like like that's information that shouldn't be given without, you know, TEDx approval. And some dude on stage talking smart to you about how to talk smart in your TEDx video. Oh, you know, this TEDx particular video. video, this particular video has um, 7,300,000 views. Holy so but Jesus there were a Christ. lot of people who wanted to find out how to sound smart in their TEDx talk. And um, we'll see. I don't know. I okay. Let's let's go. Next. And that's a lot of money from YouTube into TED Talk. Now, cool. you have to remember where we started with this too. Yeah. Feminist porn. Yeah. Um. So okay. So now I'm logged back in as me. Yeah. And the next video is how to order pizza like a lawyer. Wow. Okay, so that's incredible. Like, really? They had some guy, Steve Reed, whoever that is, probably a lawyer. He, um, he got I'm up a on lawyer. a stage. He got up on a stage and gave a talk about how to order pizza. Oh, Almost two million views on that, by the way. Yikes. Let's, let's move on. 
Okay. Down the rabbit hole we go. Wiretapping the Secret Service can be easy and fun. But what? So, what? Uh, okay, so this guy, Brian Seeley, hacker, comma, cybersecurity consultant, in 2014, Brian Seeley hacked the Secret Service and the FBI, then turned his, himself in to alert authorities to the problem. Uh, so, uh, okay. Fucking Why white hat, secret man. Like, Ooh. Oh, man. All right. I mean, the guy who, yeah. If, if you had any balls or integrity or you had any gray or black hat in you, you would have fucking turned that over to the people. Just mm -hmm. saying. Yeah. Well, the, the next video is, <laughs> is titled Top Hacker. Shows us how it's done. Mm. Pablo Holman. He's another another one of those white hats who, uh, yeah, is explaining to people how unsafe their uh, credit cards are. Yeah, yeah. All right. And we're still in we're still in TEDx thus far. Okay. Okay. Next is. Uh, a video, another video about hacking. Hacking 101. Okay. Frank Height, one of the world's foremost authorities on cybersecurity, gives the audience the gift of straight talk regarding how companies and people get hacked every day and how to avoid becoming a victim. Cool. Hacking. How do we get to hacking? Yeah, it, it likes hacking now. It's really into hacking. The algorithm's hacking it. Another one, another video by the same guy, another hacking video by the same guy. Wow. Okay. And, and now we're, and now we, let's see. Oh, nice, nice punny shell. Okay. All right. More hacking. Hacker with a ponytail. Hacker with a ponytail. Starring. Eight ways the world could end. Yeah, eight ways. Oh, excuse me. Oh, oh, this is, we got a discrepancy here. Okay, so the title is called Eight Ways the World Could Suddenly End. But yeah. the title card on the video is Ten Ways the World Could Suddenly End. So where wow. those two missing? That's just bad. That's just bad production. Yeah, false advertising. We don't like you. We don't like that guy at all. So, all right. Okay, so, so hacking, and we'll do a couple more. Okay. Do a next video up down the old YouTube rabbit hole is called "Where Are All the Aliens?" I know where the aliens are. Well, we explained that actually in one of our videos, which is funny. So, yeah. They were sausages. Right. Yeah. They were sausages. And that leads us to, that leads us out of the rabbit hole because we know where the aliens are. They're on a small island off the shore of Denmark. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually exactly where they are. Yeah. So uh, there's a new program in Denmark to house um, unwelcome foreigners on an island and this island it holds the laboratory stables and crematory of a center for researching contagious animal diseases that's where they're going to send them wow and they're going to send them on a ferry one of them is named the virus the virus yeah. The immigration minister of Denmark said they are unwanted in Denmark and they will feel that. She wrote that on Facebook. They're going to feel it. So, uh. so Denmark's government has announced an agreement to house as many as 100 people 
on Lindholm Island. These are foreigners who have been convicted of crimes, but who cannot return to their home countries uh, for a variety of reasons. The main one is which, which is, right? The main reason is, is that these people's former countries don't want them back. So they're stateless. Um, I don't know how hmm. controversial this really is. You know, these are apparently uh, convicted criminals who uh, have worn out their welcome in Denmark and are now being housed on a on a government experiment mental animal crematory island. I think it's quite a good idea, to be honest. If, they're, if they are indeed criminals, if they've committed crimes in Denmark as well and can't be sent home because they've committed crimes there, then definitely, Well, that's where they've yeah. committed the crimes. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. They've committed crimes there. Not necess- We don't know what they've done elsewhere. Right. Uh, these are for people but, who've committed crimes in Denmark. Right. Yeah, but but they're 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 clearly they've tried to send them back home and they're not being taken. So that's also an issue. So they don't want these people because they're criminal. So yeah. Look, listen. This whole thing where we moved a whole bunch of immigrants in. A lot of these people were not prepared to be civilized people and to live in the civilized Western world. And clearly, you know, stuff has happened. And it, it couldn't have been easy for any of them either. They must have arrived with nothing and felt like, you know, they needed to steal from other people too. I, I can't imagine this situ- sure. situation is a mess, you know? I, oh, yeah. Well, definitely. I mean, there's a... Uh... There's another thing I listened to last night about our own uh, migrant crisis and how that all really goes back to the policies that we were uh, we were implementing back in the in the 80s in Central and South America with all of the cocaine and the guns and the and the propping up of uh, dictators and making life there really horrible for the people there because we were getting, you know, good deals from uh, the people in power. (coughs) So now years later, now years later, uh, conditions haven't improved, and in a lot of cases they've gotten worse there. And so, of course, people are, are fleeing, and... Even, you know, you're right. We we don't necessarily have the capacity to deal with a bunch of people like just kind of wanting to come in to the country with without any resources who are in desperate need. Um, and it's but it is important to look back at how these how these conditions uh, were created. Absolutely, um, and root. Yeah, absolutely, and this this is absolutely repercussion. Yeah, it's ripple effect. You do this, you know, ten years, twenty years later, this is what happened, and now we're here. Right. But then we still have to deal with the current situation. And, yeah, and that's kind of been overblown a lot. I think um, just doing. Uh, I've done a lot of research, <laughs> mm. guys. Guys, that's funny, right? <laughs> guys. It's funny, guys. Is that funny? Yeah. So I, I, I did, extensive, in fact. It's an extensive research, guys. Yeah, yeah, guys. And these, get are, out my like, band, guys. These, are, these are numbers from, these are our own government numbers. And basically, again, back in the 80s, when we had all these people, like a lot, actually, there were a lot more uh, migrants. And... Reagan implemented a like a comprehensive amnesty for anybody who was in the country uh, when it was declared, um, and that's how a lot of people were able to stay here and and become residents and get green cards and and then you know some become citizens. Uh, yeah, there was a blanket amnesty that was declared back in the eighties uh, in the Reagan administration, and uh it the numbers kept rising and then in 2006 
uh, the immigration numbers started declining and have, and have kept declining for the last yeah. 12 years. Uh, also, what's interesting is that now there are less people coming in, and in this current administration, there are actually less people being deported, too. Wow. So it's very confusing. You know, there are less people coming in, so the population isn't growing as fast of uh, foreigners coming into the country by, by any means. These are uh, specific, specifically undocumented or illegal immigrants yeah. or aliens. Um, but they're not being deported nearly as, as uh, thoroughly as, as even like uh, Obama or Bush were deported people on a much more regular basis than than the current uh administration who's uh whose leader I will not name. I will I'm, I you know, you're right. It, it's it's so much better just not to, to avoid that whole thing yeah entirely. Uh because it only serves to because you know when you have like an epic troll, the worst thing you want to do is to acknowledge the troll. <laughs> Congratulations, you figured it out. Yes, this is so true. Stop fucking talking about him. Stop fucking talking about him. Talk about something else. Right, because you know you get you get some weird guy in your on your Facebook thread who's like saying weird shit and like get like. You know, it, especially if it's like a real troll, the last thing you want to do is start engaging with yeah. that person because that's the whole point. That's <laughs> like yeah. that. Then as soon as you say "get out of here" or "leave me alone," it, it, that then the troll has won. Well, they, and in this <laughs> case, if you say "I don't like this" or "how can he be doing this? How can he get away with this?" kind of stuff, he right. really. He's really, really winning now. You're falling yeah. for it. Right. Everyone and, and, everyone uh, has been <laughs> duped. <laughs> Everyone's been duped, and it's really stupid. I mean, and it's I'll, really stupid. I'll say it again and again, but, you know, my God. It's just everyone's you, been duped. Even... Even going back to this this story about yeah. Denmark, like that really isn't news. Like that no. shouldn't really be news. Like, and it certainly. But what they're doing is they're swaying on that that left heightened sort of SJW climate that we're in for click. You know. And they, they put that shocking headline of her Facebook post up. Yeah. Because it right. seems like it's cold and it's it's a powerful leader being right wing and cold. That's what it seems like, you know? Yeah. And but then you you kinda have to like it I mean there's if if the mainstream media has learned anything from social media, it's yeah. it's the idea of, of clickbait. Yeah. Like every story you can't, I mean, I don't know if there was once upon a time, probably not, where the the headline kind of gave you a good idea about what the article was about because their headlines were a reason, you know, they're, they're supposed to get your attention. But it seems yeah. that more and more the headlines have less and less relationship to the story. Absolutely. Like, like... I mean, wouldn't it have been better if if the headline said Denmark is um, Denmark is housing criminals on an I, I don't know something about on their own island? You know, it's something gonna, it's about gonna, something about the fact that these are uh, these are criminals in some sense, or right? It makes a difference. Like even if even if you're like wholly against the idea that that I it doesn't even get into what these people have done. Yeah. Um there's so there's so such a lack of information here and it's just very very weird and then this and then the story eventually uh 
deteriorates into um, the the last paragraph is about the summer ban on face coverings, the burqa ban, and <clears throat> the idea that uh, this Islamic garment was un un Danish. Um, mm. <clears throat> so there was that, and then another thing, this month Parliament is expected to pass legislation requiring immigrants who want to obtain citizenship to shake hands with officials as part of the naturalization ceremony, though some Muslims insist they cannot shake hands with someone of the opposite sex. And the government contends that handshakes are a basic Danish value. It's it, it's completely um, unrelated to the story itself, and mm -hmm. it's just fear more fear mongering and and the fact that someone named this government is quote unquote right wing, which like as you mentioned, therefore it's okay to for a publication like the New York Times to bash them. For any reason. Also, you know, this is just, this is psychological warfare. And anyone who reposts this article, or like even, you know, like gives this art, I mean, I think it's good that we're, we're breaking it apart, but because no one else probably is, but, uh, this is fucking, you know, this is really bad. This is really bad form, you know, on, on it the is. media. You know, this is it horrendous is. It's journalism. It's unwanted, right? Exactly. Yeah. Like, that would like be publishing an article about the United States where it said something like, unwanted citizens are being put in behind bars. Yeah. And then you read like, oh, the unwanted citizens are, are criminals and they like, yeah, they ran afoul of the justice system. And that's a different, I mean, we can and we can debate the merits of the justice system for hours, of course, because there's like a huge amount of flaws and problems with, with that in itself. But aside from that, it's that wouldn't people would be like puzzled and like and and there would be a backlash against against the headline, you know, as because. That's not true. Like, that's not the story. Yeah. It's not that they're unwanted. It's that they were in the country, committed crimes, and now they're being put somewhere else where they, they right. are not part of this general population anymore. Yeah. That's and the they're story. Being, and they're being fed yeah. and given money. Yeah. Like, it's just, yeah. Like, they're being taken it's care not of. That, like, it's, it's not they're being shipped over to an island and being left there to starve. That's not what's going on. Like people need to people yeah, need to pull right. their heads out their asses. This isn't like some movie. You know, I know you've yeah. got a Hollywood like idea about this because it's very like badly, poorly written. But this isn't this isn't what's going on. These people have right. been taken over to an island so they can humanely live. Actually Denmark has an amazing prison system. You know, if they're the amazing putting humane. people at it, right. If the Danish were putting people on an island without resources to starve, that would be bad, and 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 that would be something like worth noting. Like, yeah, hey, hey, guess, hey, this country's like just like abandoning humans on an island, and and it's like Lord of the Flies, or like that would be, yeah, that would be amazing. You know, like, people would be like, don't do that, like. <laughs> No. But in this there case, would be tremendous, there would be the, tremendous political like uproar about that. Yeah, this is not. Yeah, this is I not the argument against this is really. No, so no. There should be like a. I guess what I what I'm saying about this article and why it's not news is because who's the opposing party? Yeah, the people like the people that are on the island. I, we didn't talk to them. Like they didn't talk to them um, in this article. They talked to members of the government who explain like what's going on, and then that's it. Like yeah. they really didn't. 
get into, uh, I don't know. It's just weird. Okay, we're dragging this on anyway, so let's, let's move on, because this isn't anything worth our time anymore. This is so silly. No, I think we've, we've, it's, it's done. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> so this Brexit thingy. Oh boy. Another great fuck up that's going on. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm gonna pass on that. Well, there's, I think, I think maybe only because there's like, in the next few days, like more will kind of come out. Yeah. Sure. But, um, yeah, I still don't understand, I, I, I don't really understand, uh, like Brexit as policy. Anyway, yeah, like I don't really get it. Um, right. Like, we're going to separate from the EU just for reasons. I don't. Well, here, I don't know. Here's my, here, here's my thought on it, okay? My thought on it is, is that some politicians paid a bunch of money to start a campaign to convince the people of the UK that by separating from the EU, they would have a better life. And that it was the EU that was the problem, not the corrupt government of the UK. And yeah. I think that's generally what happened, if I'm not wrong. And now sort of it's the unraveling of everything because they can't actually deliver on this anyway. The unraveling of the corrupt, the corrupt government and really the fact that, that everyone in the government is completely corrupt. You know, it's right. not just the EU, it's, it's fucking everyone. You know, governments in general are corrupt. Right, so and it, my understanding and it, of what's going on now is that, um, <clears throat> the House of Commons, or the, the people, so to speak, the representatives yeah. of the people, they they want to know the the legalities of of this of Brexit. They want they want to be shown like the legal advice about how this uh, is supposed to work. And yeah, and <clears throat> the government ministers are saying no, that's private information. And the people don't need to know that stuff. That's our domain. And so then these ministers got held in contempt of parliament and which essentially at this point means nothing. Yeah. But if, if I guess if it continues, then people could be like removed from office. Um, and and so what it it's you know I wouldn't be surprised if this was like planned in, in some ways like like as yeah. a like diversionary tactic to get to do like the bait and switch thing you know, like misdirection like hey look over here um, while while the mechanics of, of what's going on still kind of continue. So that yeah. people wake up one morning and, and whatever is is happening is done, and they no longer have a say as to what you know what happens next because they were distracted by these um, political maneuvers. And, and that's just that's the worst of it. That, and I think that gets to your idea about why. Like not participating, not voting, uh, makes sense because, yeah. because what's, you know, ultimately what's the difference? It's just, it's just, uh, even if you get like a, I don't know, some pure hearted public servant who <clears throat> gets voted into Congress, as soon as they're in place, the, uh, the system that they have to operate under takes control. Yeah. And they realize that they can't do the things that they promised they could do because the system doesn't allow for that. 
So they right. start having to do these compromises and and negotiations and deals, like those behind the scenes deals or that out of public view and and then they realize, oh, there's a whole bunch of other people in the same position, so I can kind of hide behind these folks and let other people kind of take the blame. I kind of came like, to um, this yeah. I I came to this realization a few years ago and this is when I stopped voting that it isn't actually the people that are corrupt. It's the system and architecture itself. And the architecture creates corruption no matter what, the way it's set up at the moment. So that yeah. is what's going on. And so no matter whom you get inside, it, you will always have the same problem. Right. Yeah, exactly. In fact, uh, I remember when I was growing up, like, my mom was like, pretty civic-minded and, and smart about things like um, policy-wise and and had a pretty good uh, take on, on, like, what, you know, what works socially and governmentally and what doesn't. And people yeah. would suggest that, people suggested a number of times that, oh, you should, like, run for office. And, and her, her explanation was always like, oh, no, like, as soon as as soon as you get into that, all of those ideals have to go out the window, and you have to you have to start playing that game, which would completely eliminate any of that goodwill and, and the good ideas. They all just become talking points and campaign promises, which, strangely enough, I think as a public, we know this. Like we've been around long enough and the system has been around long enough so that we take it at, at face value that when a politician is talking, they're not telling us the truth. We know this. But if they sound good, if they say nice things, people tend to, for, like, consciously or purposefully forget that what they're hearing isn't true. But is it's weird. like, is that a psychological hypnosis? Is that like a mass hypnosis? Is it almost well, sure. mind control? Yeah, sure it is, and it's and it's facilitated by things like you know uh, political ads and and articles in in big newspapers that, yeah. that shade the truth and and blatantly lie or mislead people, and so over time. No one knows anything about what's real and what isn't real except in their own daily lives. And then of course these, these voices from, from the television or the internet or wherever they come from, like validate yeah. that. And, and so then they, you know, we walk around thinking that we know stuff. But you're, you're right. The truth is that, that we don't know shit about what, what's really going on, and um, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. No. So that's a positive message. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yay! <clears throat> We're all well, someone told me a long time ago. Someone told me a long time ago that um, that every economy is is local. Like, uh, yeah. You know, like you're you're doing a certain. You're at a certain level, socio socioeconomically in your home and your family and in your life, and you don't know what the, you don't know what your neighbors are up to. You don't know if they have millions in the bank. You don't know if they're broke. You don't you don't know, and and that makes a huge difference in how people perceive things. Yeah. Like, well, my economy is just fine, you know, and and and. uh and you're not even aware, not even allowed to be aware of how your neighbor is doing. No, like that's that's forbidden. Like that's and that's that's part or of the even, system. Or even right? the person you're living with. Like I have no idea what goes on with my mother's economy at all. Right. You know. Right. Right. And and we've been trained to keep that stuff 
um, hidden. Why do we do that, though? Like, what was the whole point of that? Was that for security of banks or, or our own possessions? Or, you know, I don't know. It's one of the things that people don't really disclose. Like, we'll talk about almost anything, like, except how they're doing financially because I think because they're afraid that if they disclose where they're at, that immediately begins a comparison to whoever they are, they're talking about. So it's either going to go two ways. Like somebody is, well, somebody's going to be disappointed. Yeah. It's, it's like when I was working, um, in, in staffing, I would always tell my employees, even if they're working side by side, never to ask the other person how much money they're making. Yeah. For that reason. Like, don't talk about it because if if you're making fifteen dollars an hour and you say so, and the person, like, say the person next to you that you you, you tell this to, they're making twenty dollars an hour or they're making ten dollars an hour, like somebody's going to be pissed off. Riot! For, Riot! For doing the same for doing the same job. For, and right. There may be a variety right. of reasons why. Someone gets more or less money, they may have more experience. Things like there could be a lot of reasons. And, so it's corporate has, control then. It's basically a corporate control. That it's it's enforced by corporations. That's who actually teaches it. They don't want anyone yeah. to tell each other so that there's no dysfunction within. Right, right. Don't you know, even though you're working so the, funny. the job for money, even though you're doing this job for money, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's a it's a big problem. Huge, because that yep. that prevents unionization on pay, doesn't it? Really, sure. I mean that that prevents any discussion about fairness or equality of pay. Right, that's so fucked it's, up, man. It is, and and does does that bring us back around to feminist porn? Equality yes. and e- ethics and yes and uh, and, and nice and and no one's being coerced. Yep. And everyone everyone's wants happy. To be there. You know, there's, everyone's being no paid heads well. In, no heads in the toilet, right? It's not like no, no. porn. <laughs> it's not like that kind. That kind of porn. You know, it's like, you know those actresses though who agree to, like, have their head dunked in the toilet while being fucked. They yeah. make good money. They make really fucking good money. Right. Hey, so, like, uh, is that, that's a new thing on the list, like... Meanwhile, like, the guy... Sex, anal... Meanwhile, swirling. the guy's hand... The guy's hand yeah. who dunked the actress's head in the toilet? Yeah. He's not right. making good money. No. He's and his hand went in the toilet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's horrible. All right. Yep. Yeah. It's awful. Wow. Yep. Yeah. And he has it, you know. What yeah. a great episode about feminist yeah. porn. Amazing. Wow. <laughs> All right, man. Wow. wow. Episode 32 of the VB In podcast the butt. with Shorts and Aurelius. We're done. In the butt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Hooker, hooker, I like.